Ed Theodore Guyen was born on August 27, 1906, in La Crosse County, Wisconsin. Ed Guyen grew up in a family of four, an alcoholic father George, a dominant and extremely religious mother Augusta, and an older brother Henry. Augusta hated her husband, an alcoholic who could not keep his job. There was no reason for these two people, or complete opposites, to get married. George worked at various times as a carpenter, tanner, and insurance agent. Augusta ran a local grocery store for several years, earning enough income to comfortably support the family. Augusta decided that it was best for Guyon and Henry to take them away from city life so that she could keep them away from the evil and sins of the city. He left the city to live in isolation on a 155-acre, 63-hectare farm in the town of Plainfield, Wisconsin. It has now become the permanent residence of the Guyon family. George became hopelessly ill and did not help his family at all on the farm, wasting most of his earnings on alcohol. Guyon only left the farm to go to school, Augusta took advantage of the farm's isolation by turning away strangers who might influence her sons outside of school. Kain spent most of his time doing chores on the farm. Augusta was fervently religious and nominally Lutheran. He preached to his sons about the inherent depravity of the world, the evil of drinking, and his belief that all women except himself were naturally promiscuous and tools of the devil. He took time every afternoon to read to them from the Bible, often choosing verses from the Old Testament and the book of Revelation about death, murder, and divine punishment. Over time, Gind developed a growth on his left eyelid and was made fun of and ostracized by his classmates. Kine was shy, and his classmates and teachers noted that he had strange mannerisms, such as laughing randomly, as if he were laughing at his own jokes. To make matters worse, Augusta would punish him whenever he tried to make friends. Despite his poor social development, Kine did reasonably well in school, especially in reading. In 1920, Gein finished eighth grade and then dropped out of school, yet remained an avid reader. In 1927, Augusta made both of her sons promise that they would always remain virgins. Gein and Henry started doing odd jobs in town to cover their living expenses. She enjoyed babysitting because she could relate better to children than adults. The brothers were generally considered trustworthy and honest by community residents. Henry began dating a divorced mother of two and planned to move in with her. Kine was worried about his brother's attachment to their mother, and so suspicions about his brother's death grew on Kine. Kine had to travel to Milwaukee for his military physical. He was rejected due to a growth on his left eye that slightly impaired his vision. On April 1, 1940, Gein's father, George, died at the age of 66 from heart failure caused by his alcoholism and pneumonic fluid in his lungs. Augusta attributed his death to his weakness and frequently made reference to George that he was going to hell. On May 16, 1944, Gein and Henry were burning marsh vegetation on the property. The fire got out of control, prompting the local fire brigade to activate. Towards the end of the day, the fire was extinguished and the firefighters left. Gein reported his brother missing. A search party using flashlights searched for Henry and found his body lying face down. Apparently, he had been dead for some time, 
and, since he was not burned or injured, the cause of death was determined to be heart failure. But the only problem was that Gein led the investigators directly to Henry. It was later reported by biographer Harold Schechter that Henry had bruises on his head. Police ruled out any mistake, and the county medical examiner later officially listed the cause of death as drowning. Authorities accepted this theory, but there was no official investigation and no autopsy. Kain and his mother were now alone. Augusta suffered a stroke shortly after Henry's death, and Kain devoted himself to caring for her. Sometime in 1945, Kain recounted, he and his mother visited a man named Smith who lived nearby to buy hay. According to Gein, Augusta witnessed Smith beating a dog. A woman at Smith's home came out and yelled at him to stop, but Smith beat the dog to death. Augusta was very upset by this scene, but it seemed that it was the woman's presence that disturbed her, not the brutality towards the dog. Augusta told Gein that the woman was not married to Smith, so there was no point in her being there. Augusta angrily called her Smith's whore. Augusta soon suffered a second stroke, and her health rapidly deteriorated. Augusta died on December 29, 1945, at the age of 67. Gein was devastated by his death. In the words of writer Harold Schechter, she had lost her only friend and her only true love, and now she was absolutely alone in the world. Kain continued to live on the farm and earned money from odd jobs to get by. He cordoned off the rooms used by his mother, including the upstairs and downstairs, the lounge and the living room, untouched while the rest of the house became increasingly miserable and evil, the guarded rooms remained intact. Kain then began living in a small room next to the kitchen. Around this time, he became interested in reading pulp magazines and adventure books, especially on cannibals, Nazi atrocities, decapitation, grave robbing, and human anatomy. Once, a little boy who occasionally fished came to visit Gein. Gein showed him the skulls he kept in his bedroom and explained that he had obtained them from some men who were skull hunting in the Pacific Ocean. When the child told these things to his elders, the elders thought that they were a product of his imagination and did not take him seriously. However, after a while, two young people who stopped by the farm saw the same thing. They thought what they saw was a mask for a Halloween. Rumors about the skulls Gein possessed had spread throughout the town. No one suspected Gein until Bernice Worden disappeared years later. When they came across Gein, they even made fun of him and said, Hey Gein, you keep skulls in your room? and Gein confirmed what was said with a smile. Nobody thought such a thing would be right. In everyone's eyes, Gein was a slightly crazy but harmless person who lived on a neglected farm outside the town. Eighteen months after Augusta died, Gein described intense loneliness and subsequent strange events. He occasionally visited the cemetery where his mother was buried. After several visits, he began digging up bodies in the cemetery. The first body he excavated was his mother's, so Gein took his dead mother's head and shrunk it to size as described in his book. Gein began making a female suit with the corpses he killed and stole so that his mother could always be with him and he could literally get under her skin. Kind denied having sexual intercourse with the bodies he exhumed, saying, They smell so bad during state crime lab questioning. 
Gein also admitted to the shooting death of saloon owner Mary Hogan, who had been missing since 1954. However, he later admitted that he did not remember the details of her death. When asked, Gein told investigators that between 1947 and 1952, during blackouts, he made as many as 40 nightly visits to three local cemeteries to exhume recently buried bodies. On about 30 of these visits, when he regained consciousness, while at the cemetery, he said he left the grave in good condition and returned home empty-handed. On other visits, he dug up the graves of recently buried middle-aged women whom he thought resembled his mother and took their bodies home. Here she tanned their hides to make her own tools. Kain admitted to robbing nine local cemeteries and led investigators to their locations. Three test graves identified by Gein were open. The coffins were in wooden boxes. The tops of the boxes were about two feet 61 centimeters below the surface in sandy soil. Immediately after the funerals, while the graves were not yet completed, Gein robbed the graves. The test graves were conducted to make sure officials were confident that Gein, who was frail, was capable of digging grave alone overnight. They found the graves as Gein described. Two of the exhumed coffins were empty. One had a crowbar instead of a body. Gein was unable to open one coffin because he lost his crowbar, and in total, most of the bodies he wanted to take were gone from the other coffins. Kine left the rings and some body parts back. Thus, Gein's confession was largely confirmed. On the morning of November 16, 1957, Bernice Worden, who ran a hardware store in Plainfield, disappeared. A Plainfield resident reported his hardware store truck was driven through the back of the building around 9.30 a.m. Deputy Frank Worden, Bernice Worden's son, entered the store around 5 p.m. The store's safe was open and there were blood stains on the floor. It was said that Gein was at the store the evening before Bernice Worden disappeared and would return the next morning for a gallon of antifreeze. A sales receipt for a gallon of antifreeze was the last receipt Worden wrote the morning he disappeared. That evening, Gein was arrested at a grocery store in West Plainfield and the Washar County Sheriff's Department searched the Gein farm. A Washar County Sheriff's deputy found Bernice Worden's body in a cabin on Gein's property. She discovered his body hanging upside down with a crossbar and ropes around his ankles. He had been shot with a point to caliber rifle, and the mutilations were determined to have been posthumously inflicted. Plainfield saloon owner Mary Hogan with whom Gein had been in a relationship before, disappeared from her own store. Police found bloodstains and spent bullet casings on the ground. Gein later confessed to killing Mary Hogan. He wanted to take her home and hang out with her and drank some. He then drew the curtains and put the point two to caliber pistol to his forehead and shot him. As a result of the autopsy report of Mary Hogan and Bernice Worden, it was determined that they died as a result of a single gunshot wound to the forehead of Mary Hogan and to the back of the head of Bernice Worden. Kine was also considered a suspect in several unsolved cases in Wisconsin, including the disappearances of Evelyn Hartley, Georgia Weckler, Victor Bunk Travis, and his friend Ray Burgess. Evelyn Grace Hartley was an American teenager from La Crosse, Wisconsin, 
who was missing since 1953 on October 24, 1953. His disappearance sparked a search involving 2,000 people. In the first year following his disappearance, investigators questioned more than 3,500 people. As of 2021, no trace of him has been found. His father found signs of struggle, blood stains, and footprints in his home, including his broken glasses. Georgia Weckler was last seen on May 1, 1947, near her farmhouse in rural Fort Tatkinson, Wisconsin. At approximately 3.30 p.m., he disappeared without a trace, and the only clue found were tire tracks from a Ford that Gein also owned. Victor Bunk, Travis, and Ray Burgess disappeared from a bar in Plainfield on November 16, 1957. No trace of them or their car was found. While kidnapping was out of character for Gein, police still think he played a role in their disappearance. Authorities searching Gein's home found the following. All human bones and parts, a wastebasket made of human skin, human skin covering several chair seats, skulls on bed posts, female skulls, some with their tops cut off, bowls made of human skulls, corset made of a woman's skin from shoulders to waist, gaiters made from human leg skin, masks made from the skin of women's heads, Mary Hogan's face mask in a paper bag, Mary Hogan's skull in a box, Bernice Worden's whole skull in the sack, Bernice Worden's heart in a plastic bag in front of Gein's potbelly stove, a lampshade made from the skin of a human face and women's nails. These artifacts were photographed at the state crime laboratory and then disposed of. The psychologist and psychiatrist who interviewed Gein in 1957 said that he was a schizophrenic and sexual psychopath. Later, Gein, doctor, he interviewed Schubert. Schubert described Gein as having an abnormally great devotion to his mother. During an interrogation, Washara County Sheriff Archley reportedly attacked Gein by slamming his head and face against a wall. As a result, Gein's initial confession was deemed inadmissible. Schley died of heart failure at age 43 in 1968. Before Gein's trial, one of Schley's friends said, he was Gein's victim, as if he had slain him. Later, Gein doctor, he interviewed Schubert. Schubert described Gein as having an abnormally great devotion to his mother. During an interrogation, Washara County Sheriff Archley reportedly attacked Gein by slamming his head and face against a wall. As a result, Gein's initial confession was deemed inadmissible. Schley died of heart failure at age 43 in 1968 before Gein's trial. One of Schley's friends said he was Gein's victim, as if he had slain him. Gein admitted to killing two women, both of whom allegedly resembled his mother, but pleaded not guilty because he was out of his wits. He was deemed unfit to stand trial in late 1957 and was subsequently and fined to various psychiatric institutions. However, in 1968, when it was determined that he could participate in his own defense, Gein was tried and found guilty of killing Worden. Reportedly, prosecutors wanted to pin only one murder on Gein for some reason. However, he was later tried for losing his temper at the time of the crime. He returned to the mental hospital where he stayed until his death in 1984. In 1984, Gein became senile and died after a long bout with cancer. He died of respiratory failure in his ward in Mendota.
He was considered a model patient by many at the hospital, mild-mannered and always helpful. Kine was buried next to his mother in the Planfield Cemetery at 6 a.m. on July 27, 1984. With only four people present, Kine's farm, personal belongings, and Ford car were sold at auction. In 1985, Kine's house of horrors was destroyed by fire, which remains unclear.